So just um, so you understand how this is going to work, the idea is I'm starting, we're going to pull sound off of this and not video just for like radio purposes. Gotcha. But video, I'm starting a new Sunday morning thing where I'm doing a little video thing. And it's really casual, but I would love to have some sure. bits of this in that sometime in the next few weeks. I'm sort of scheduling them out the next, so. Um, why don't we start with this? How long now have you been in the office? I have been in the office since November 21st, pretty much. November 21st, 2022. It's been almost three months. It has been. How's your first quarter been? Busy. Yeah? Very busy. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot going on. There's been a lot of, um, you know, different things that were in the works before, mm -hmm. you know, I got into this position that I'm trying to catch up with and, uh, you know, continue on. Um, we're trying to get up into the digital age. And so we've done a few different things with uh, different software programs and that type of things. What's that going to do for, for the department? It's going to create a lot better platform for evidence and evidence sharing. Uh, right now, we, we burn DVDs for evidence, surveillance videos, pictures, everything goes onto a DVD, gets sent to the state's attorney. We just got a program called iCrime Fighter, which is going to do all that for us. We can, you know, if we have a retail theft at Walmart, we can send them a link. They upload the video on that link. It goes right into the case file that we need. So it's a web-based tool that's immediate. Yes. It's you don't have to get a disc over to the state's correct. attorney's office. People that have ring videos, I can send them a link. They can send it right to us. Oh. We can send it right to the state's attorney's office. Um, it saves tons of time. Burning DVDs takes forever. I so, imagine there's a, an associated expense too, but you're probably paying something for the web. I'm getting, thing. I'm, I'm freeing up my evidence custodians by about six hours per weekend. So that's how many DVDs we're making. So that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's yeah. a big deal. How so, many officers do you have in there? We have 24 sworn personnel. Do you have? Uh, openings for others down the road or is it uh, um, how are yeah. things going i you know i think we'll, we'll see about that there's some different things i'd like to look into as far as you know um you, we were previously part of trident's drug task force years ago um we kind of branched off and created our own within the city of peru kind of just service the city of peru um we don't have that anymore personnel issues as far as staffing peru is a busy place um you know, the daytime population in Peru is quite large. So our calls for service are, are pretty high. We, we, they're running a lot. And currently they're only required to have, you know, for their contract, three people working at all times. So you can imagine somebody takes off, then there's three people working, running call to call. So yeah. staffing wise, I think we're, we're sitting pretty good now. I've been able to, um, for now, eliminate the deputy chief position, created a patrol lieutenant's position. So I have that in place, did that testing process. So we'll have my patrol lieutenant will be in place at the beginning of March, which will take a lot off of my plate, <laughs> which will be very helpful. You'll be able to delegate more to yes. that while you focus on bigger picture things? Correct. I've always been in charge of the patrol division since I was a commander. Yeah. And that's still not changed, you know, to this point because, you know, now that, you have, now that you're the chief, you've got to, you've yeah. got to give somebody else a chance to develop those skills. Exactly. Yeah. And it creates succession in that and, and allow those people opportunity to move up to the position that I'm in. So it sounds like uh, structurally everything's good. Yep. Um, what about, um, have, do you, do you sense a mandate now that you've been in the office for a while? As far as uh, from from the public, uh, what what things what things do you want to get done in the next nine months to make it your first year? What do you want to do over the next year? Whatever. Um, yeah, there's a couple different things I definitely want to do. Um, officer wellness is huge right now. Um, it's part of that bill that came out, uh, that house bill that came out, and all the trailer bills in, include officer wellness. There's a mandate that officers need to go talk to somebody and they need to do things. So. I'm actually currently collaborating with the Aruka Institute of Healing, um, the chief of police in Ottawa, Brent Rolson, and the chief of police in Princeton at this point right now um, to kind of create a program that includes all of that for officer wellness, allows them an opportunity on a confidential basis to talk to somebody, have somebody ride around with them. We call it windshield therapy. Um, they have a counselor just ride with them you know, eventually, hopefully they'll talk if they need to. Have you ever done that before here? Um, yeah, we have uh, somebody from Aruka comes once. It used to be once every week. Um, they're doing some different things now, different programs. 
Um, but is that voluntary? Yep. Do people volunteer? Yeah. Really? People yeah. will people will say, "Hey, come ride with me," or you know, they that understand the value. Of yeah, it yeah, it's it's big and it's funny because there's a divide with the older officers and the younger officers, and the younger officers they they get it. They're like, "Yeah, officer wellness, that's key." And my older officers are like, "Yeah, I'll just keep to myself over here," you know. But the old way of doing things. Yeah, there's they, value in it, and they they're starting to see that, you know. And so Rod it's does a of, lot of talking about that actually, yeah. about how generationally there are different perspectives on things. Oh, it is it is so different, and it's harder for some of the older officers to buy into that. There's there's a gap in definitely needs a bridge from my younger ones to my older ones and I'm an older one now you know I am I'm just an older one now and so you see how they are they ask so many questions and they you know they're, they they like to ask why and they you know when yeah. I started it was okay you just did what they told you to do mm -hmm. and you didn't question you salute it. And you do it yeah and so now the older ones are like well what do you mean why well <laughs> they want to know what that answer is you know they want to know so it's, it's got to be good. happening everywhere. It, it can't is. just be happening here. No, but, it is. But and I imagine you're the bridge then. Do you see yourself as a generational bridge then? Yeah. Because you have to get everybody on the same page. Yeah, and I have my older ones will come talk to me about it. And they'll say, listen, this is what the culture is now. This You, you have to embrace it. You've got to take it in or it's, you're going to drive yourself nuts trying to figure out these young these young kids. You know, So they've done a nice job and they're starting to kind of come around to it. And um, it's just different. It's just a different culture now. And it's not a bad thing. I think it's great. Not at all. It's just a different perspective. Yep. I think. And yeah. um, it's fresh. It's I don't. Fresh. I don't know how it could hurt. As a matter of fact, even, even the like the lowest bar is what can it hurt? Yeah. It would seem to be something that's I mean, well above that. Exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. It, it it's nice. So and and being able to work with everybody, you know, different departments and that and, and that's nice too. Having people on the same page with you. Let's talk collaboration for a second. Um, how's your relationship with the other chiefs in the area? Uh, Seems to be great. I had a great relationship with them prior to even being the chief. Uh, I did a lot of different things with a lot of the different chiefs. So um, I've been around Mike Smajinski for years, um, you know, since I started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's been there. So he and I have a nice relationship, you know, right next door. So that's good. Um, I've met and collaborated a little bit with Brent Rolson in Ottawa. Um, he was actually one of the people on my panel to interview my, for my patrol lieutenant's position. Um, Tom Kamerer in Princeton, he and I have a good relationship. We all kind of have the same ideas, you know, same values and belief system as far as what we want our police departments to become, how we want them to be run. And, and uh, I think that's very important. I know you can't speak for your, um, for your peers in the other departments, but in general, have you heard people talk about the generational differences among officers? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's just something that is now, you know, and how are they handling it that in the same, in the same ways they have the, you know, same kind of ideas and they're trying to bridge those gaps too. And they understand it and they can see it. So I think everybody's kind of, you know, we talk about it and everybody's on the same page and how to, how to handle that. Um, you know, they are who they are and they bring a whole nother realm to this policing job. And I think it's a great thing. So you became an officer when? June 20th, 2004. Look at you, okay. So. <laughs> Everybody knows their start date. <laughs> so 19 years, Dang. almost 20 years. Yep. Looking back on it, what do you think? Boy, it's changed a lot, a lot. It's changed a lot, which isn't a bad thing. Um, I've done a lot of different things in my 19 years. Um, you know, I've been a supervisor in this job, for 14 of those 19 years. I was promoted as a sergeant with five years on. So I, uh, I've always kind of been, a, you know, in that leadership role, which I enjoy, you know. Um, I know I've shown up at uh, incidents and this is before you were promoted to chief and you were pretty much in control. <laughs> well, thank yeah, you. <laughs> well, no, because that's what you had to be. I yeah, mean, yeah, I yeah. just, I think we all in the media just assumed you were going to be chief at some point. <laughs> Well, so well, sooner, sooner than later was what we thought too. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I mean, you just seem to have it all together and a good perspective on things. Well, I try to. I like. I feel like I have a good perspective on things, and I want to bring you know new things, and I want people. I'm really big on transparency. I think that's really important. I don't think there should be a lot of closed doors unless it's absolutely necessary. I like everybody to know what's going on unless it's absolutely necessary that they don't. I've been in those dark shadows before of 
well, what's that, you know? And I just feel like being transparent is a big key to your people, you know, trusting you, Trust. having that respect for you, you know, and that type of thing. So that's a big thing for me. But yeah, it's been a 19 years, not as long as some, but uh, long enough. Steady progression. Though. Yeah, it's, yeah. You gotta be proud of what you've achieved so far. I am, I am. I've done some things that have been really, I've had the opportunity to do some really cool things. Um, and so, yeah, I like that a lot. Chief, when, uh, when was the moment you realized as a kid that you wanted to be a cop? Oh, I don't think I did. Uh, I was in college when I was forced to declare a major. <laughs> and, and I always liked investigating things and trying to figure things out and, and finding an endpoint. I always wanted to know if I had to get to that end point, you know, to figure it out. And so they made me declare a major in college my junior year. And so I said, oh, okay, well, criminal justice, that's pretty cool. Where did you go? I went to Olivet Nazarene mm -hmm. University. So you had, to, you had to declare your junior year? And... Yep. And that's what I picked. So that was the calling moment. That was the calling moment. Some kids moment. Wake, wake up in the morning knowing that they want to be a police officer. I was five years old, and all I wanted for my fifth birthday was a policeman's cap. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you, just, you know, kids love, I think, the, the idea of being a cop, but it never hit you. No, I never, I never really, I think if you look back and like every year, you know, when they ask you, what do you want to be? I don't know that that was ever an answer from me, but I knew that I really liked, I really wanted to be a homicide detective somewhere. That was always my, once I decided on criminal justice, I was like, oh, that would be cool. I'll do that. Well, then you realize you have to start at the bottom and then you're. Well, kind of I, progress on your way up and you know i imagine that's a uh, that's got to be one of those fields in law enforcement that just takes a certain type oh, um yeah. the pain that you're dealing with and the, and the loved ones you were ready to deal with that i i don't know that i fully time. understood it you okay. know i don't know that i fully understood the magnitude it had the impact it had you know that type of thing at that point it was like oh that would be cool they have all the TV shows, the yeah. homicide detectives. Yeah, you know, like Joe Kenda, homicide, that guy, he was awesome. So, <laughs> but uh, I don't know that I, I really understood that fully until, you know, I got into this job. And then it was like, all right, the first time you go to a call with a deceased person, you're just like, wow, you know, and their loved ones are there. And that that's really a big moment. And now... It's not that you're desensitized to it, but you're almost, you know. You have a job to do. Yeah, you're just there and, and you're doing the, the job. The family you wants you to do. solve it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, there's a big difference from when I first started to now in my thinking. But, you know, I've always been, I've always wanted to help people. Like, you know, why do you want to be a police officer? I want to help people. Well, you know, there's more to it than that. But, yeah, I just, uh, I have a heart for the victim, I guess. And I want to. I would think that a police chief needs that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you don't have that, what are you really there for? I think that it's a question of what we see the police as. And uh, if kids are brought up to believe that the police are our friends and protectors, then it's uh, it, it's something I'm sure that's not happening as much as it should. I'm, a, I'm I just from just casually viewing, I don't think kids are maybe you can comment better. I mean, the kids are not probably learning what good the police can do for them. No, I think um, I think when they're real little they are, and then I think you have people that'll see you. I've had it before where they see you and their kid's acting up or something. They say, if you don't stop, I'm going to have that officer come over here. And it drives me insane. And That's a threat. I, I've stopped yeah. and actually said, no, I won't. You call me if you ever need anything, you know, right. just to make sure that the kids do understand that that's why we're here, you know, and, and that type of thing. So I've rolled up with, to Northview with you guys a couple years ago when you played kickball with yeah. the kids. I was in then Chief Burnaby's car, and I swear I'm never going to forget those kids jumping up and down oh, and yeah. cheering when the police came through yep. and they were getting ready to play. It looks like you've just got a wonderful opportunity if you can, I don't want to say grab them, but if you can yeah. reach out to them at a young age to yeah. change how a generation is thinking. We are, we are in the schools. We're walking around the schools. Um, we're meeting the kids trying to do things like that, like the kickball game, you know, that was huge for me. I was really excited about that. That was a fun day. That was a lot of fun. And we, we played dodgeball with crew Catholic kids, you know, <laughs> I mean, they loved it. Um, those are the things, those are the interactions you want them to have because not everybody in those schools has a positive police interaction. 
And that's one of the things that I try to push here. I want you to have positive police interactions with people. You don't always have to be negative. You know, I used to say, when I talk to friends or whatever, at least in your job, people are happy to see you when you show up, you know? But it doesn't always have to be that way either, you know? I know that we're talking for a long time. God, it's so much fun talking to you, actually. I'm enjoying <laughs> it. Um, this is uh, it's wonderful stuff. Well, how's that? Just quickly, you know, I... <laughs> I was afraid when I set up this interview that you were going to think I was only talking to you because you're a female police chief. Oh, never crossed my mind. That ain't the case. It's really not. Has the public said anything about your being a first, and how does that feel? It's kind of crazy because I understand it's like a historic thing, and I get that. You know, I never looked at it that way. I've always been in a, a job that it was more inclined for men to have years ago. I've stood at the counter when somebody's asked to talk to a police officer wearing the same uniform. I look behind myself and say, how about me, you know, and, and, yeah. and then how about a supervisor? How about me, you know, so I've been through it all. Really? And I've been to calls where they'll, you'll ask them a question, they'll look at the, the male police officer and answer, you know, and it's just, and it's always been something that I've just, yeah, whatever, you know, I'm still going to do my job and be the best at it that I can be. I never understood the impact of my position and becoming a female police chief in this area until I was at a, um, I think it was, I think it was Bob Fishka's retirement party actually. And a woman came up to me and she was almost in tears telling me how important it was that I became in this position because she moved to this area 40 years ago and couldn't even get a job in a construction crew and construction's what she wanted to do and she had to hold the flag and she wanted me to realize how important it was that that this was such a big moment you know and i never really understood it until feel, i talked to her do you feel more weight on your shoulders when you hear things like that not so much i think i feel more a relief for people who always wanted to see that happen and maybe thought they never would you know so that's kind of a cool thing to be able to talk to people um i've had people say to me well, forget that you're a woman. Aren't you like one of the youngest, you know? And That would seem to be a, probably a more relevant issue yeah. than anything because of the uh, the quick, uh, the quick yeah. progression. Yeah, so I was like, oh, well, you know, that's true too. But I guess I've always looked at it as, you know, I always want a means to an end, you know, and I, that was my goal was, you know. It just I, is. I, yeah, I've done just things is. to get to that point and, and here I am. So, and hopefully I can do with it, you know, make it a, better place not to be cliche but i want to leave it better than i found it you know which seems to be the approach everybody should take in yeah, their jobs yeah so it's been it's been interesting but yeah for for the people that come up to me and say those things you know i didn't really understand the impact I, that was until it's interesting yeah um okay jelani day what can you share with me i can share with you that um it is still an open and active investigation that it is a death investigation to this point um, as opposed to um, you you could call it a crime you could call it something else but we just don't have any factual information to say that it is anything other than a suspicious death at this point um, you know we've we've put in a lot of man hours to try to find out what happened to him. Um, the, the hard part with the case is it spread across the state. <laughs> you know, it started in Bloomington. He was missing from Bloomington. So he's from Decatur too, right? He's from- No, I'm sorry, uh, Danville. Danville. Sorry, yeah, Danville. Yeah, he's from Danville. He was going to school at ISU. Um, he was only there for a couple of weeks uh, for the, his um, speech pathology uh, master's program. Mm -hmm. um, I can share that he was missing from Bloomington Last time anybody saw him was at you know nine twenty in the morning on that Tuesday. Was that at the uh, cannabis shop? Beyond Hello. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you know they found his car two days later in the ravine mm -hmm. by, area, the YMCA. by the YMCA. Um, his car was found in Peru, and his lanyard was found in Peru. Um, everything else, there's nothing else that was found in Peru. His body was not found in Peru. His body was not. His body was located in an unincorporated part of LaSalle County, not in Peru. It would be just to the south of Peru's jurisdiction. 
across the shore. Mm -hmm. What bridge would it have been near? 251, but not incorporated in Peru. Correct. Yeah, okay. Because when Jesse Jackson and the crew were here uh, a couple years ago, Mm -hmm. they had the, uh, they rallied down at that point uh, near Mays, I remember, because that was the understanding of where he was found. It was across across the the river river from that, which is unincorporated. South, yep, on the south side. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, So you're dealing with multiple police agencies, and I imagine state police, and are the the federal officers declined to participate, didn't they? So they cannot take part in the investigation as far as talking to people, taking over the investigation, or those types of things, because there's no federal nexus. There's nothing that connects us to be a federal anything, um, which has been explained numerous times. But the mother still thinks the FBI should be involved. I've asked the FBI to take the case. They've declined because they can't. Federally, federal law prohibits them from doing so. What they can do is they can help with any services we may want, So, and they have. So we have evidence at their you know, regional computer lab um, in Chicago. We have um, used their victim services. We have used um, their evidence tech has come and taken sent samples from the car. We've done a lot of different things with the FBI. I'm in contact with the FBI, you know, they're always saying, is there anything else we can do? Is there anything you need? Um, we've sent things to Quantico to get further analysis to see if there can be any more. Um, but that Quantico being just for the clarification of the listeners and the viewers, the, the FBI's training facility or headquarters? Their headquarters, their, headquarters, their main right? headquarters, yes. Yeah, they have so something that's, in the district, but Quantico is where a lot of them are, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so Quantico is where where their main headquarters mm-hmm. is, and that's where a lot of their uh, more, I guess, superior lab type things can take place. Well, Chief, um, hmm. um, so if, if Jelani Day's body was not found in Peru and it was found in unincorporated LaSalle County, I mean, who's in charge of the investigation? So the problem has always been everybody's wanted somebody to take the case and it's just not possible when you have that many entities, which is why the task force was created. And you created the task force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the task force was created. um, The LaSalle County Sheriff's Office was called when the body was located um, because that's technically their jurisdiction, which is how they entered into the case. Um, You know, his clothing was found in the city of LaSalle. His wallet was found in the city of LaSalle, you know, so that's how they're incorporated in the case. The state police came on board just to assist. Um, so they are, they have assisted. Uh, Bloomington Police Department is obviously part of it. And, um, and then us. And so creating the task force and having the meetings here, um, you know. That's sort of presented you as the lead agency in this whole thing basically you took the initiative correct and that's why so you're getting <laughs> people think that we yeah. are the lead agency because you took the initiative in yeah. creating the, the yeah. task force correct but so. so now you're you guys are on the hook and we're on the hook yeah and and you know we've done a major part of the investigation um Bloomington police department's done a major part of the investigation um you know everybody else is the auxiliary Early on, we we had tasks, task lists, and everybody was tasked things. We'd have tips come in. Everybody was tasked with that. We just don't have any of that anymore. We've never had anybody complain and say anything. We've never had anybody with a tip that panned out to be anything. Um, And and there's a $10,000 reward from the FBI to call the tip line. Um, There's just... What else is needed? What do you need right now to break this thing? You know... You almost need a witness, eyewitness. I, I don't know what else, how else to to break it or... I mean, does the task force go on indefinitely or...? I mean, until there's absolutely no more leads, yeah. We're still waiting on a few things, trying to break into his phone. That's um, been a while. What's yeah, going on with that? There's no brute force that supports the operating system on his phone right now, so we can't break into it um when that when that comes out when that software comes out and we'll so right now hook it up and is try ta- to go through it explain to me how the task force works is it meeting regularly still not not as regularly uh we still communicate with each other uh, we met in october i think is the last time we might have met um as one big group i talk to those investigators all the time however uh you know anything that comes about or 
you know, we, we've talked after the Monday council meeting, we all talked, you know, to see really, is there anything else? What are we missing? What can we do? So if somebody's interviewing friends and associates, but that's other police departments, in other words, just chasing it down day to day. Is there any day to day work being done anymore on it? I guess I'm saying, I mean, you're the task force, but you're leading it, but is, is Jelani Day's mother right in worrying that this thing is not going to be solved? I am not real confident in it being solved as far as what happened to him, um, just in the, f the case that we have now and the facts that we have now. If something else comes out and it breaks, then, I mean, I mean, we are not not doing anything. We are, we are always talking about it. We are always looking at it. We are always questioning each other about it. We're always, you know, doing something. Is it daily? No. She's right that I hadn't talked to her since whatever date she said. Um, and that was because my last correspondence with her was, uh, you know, that we, if anything else, if there's any other questions you have, let me know. Or if you have um, any other information that we come across, or if there's anything you need to know, we'll let you know. Um, so, I mean. That can't go on indefinitely. It could. There's cold cases out there from forever ago, you know, so that's not what I want. It's not an acceptable answer for you. Correct. Not at all. That's not acceptable. It's not for her either. I want nothing more than to find out what happened to her son. Nothing more. And it's a real fear of mine that I could in my career and never have that answer. But I'm not going to stop trying to find that answer ever. I mean, there's been people retired that were on the task force now, you know, as these things go on and on, maybe fresh eyes looking at it every now and again could help. You know, we've seen it for so long and the same things. And I imagine that's a frustration. We'll wrap it up here, but I imagine that's a frustration most police officers have is there's something when they retire that they tried so hard to do and it couldn't get done. Yeah, that is my biggest fear in this, in this whole case because I have, you know, I've spent a lot of time on this case, not, I mean, me personally, but everybody else has too, but, you know, I have an investment in it, you know, and I, I want to know what happened for his mother. I want to know what happened for her in a bad way. And she might be mad at me right now, and she might be mad at everybody involved, and I get that. I get it because she lost her son, and that's not fair. But I'm not stopped trying to find out what happened to him. Chief, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Appreciate it, and congratulations, and welcome. Thank and good you. Good luck to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully it goes well. <laughs>